yes, uh, thank you for, for inviting me to, to join today. Uh, so yeah, I guess a, a few things about, about myself. So my name is Francois Foucault. Uh, I am currently a professor at the University of New Hampshire, which is in the northeastern US, uh, about an hour and a half north of Boston. Uh, I'm originally from Belgium, spent some time in both Brussels and Paris during my undergrad. And then I moved to North America for my PhD uh, at Cornell in upstate New York. Uh, spent six years there and then some time as well in Toronto at the Canadian Institute for Theoretical Astrophysics uh, and at the Lawrence Berkeley National Lab uh, in California. Uh, most of what I do research-wise uh, involves the study of compact binary mergers. So what happens when two very compact objects like black holes and neutron stars come together and collide in what is one of the most uh, energetic events that we can observe um, in the universe today and certainly the strongest source of gravitational waves that we have been uh, able to observe. Uh, specifically, uh, I work on doing numerical simulations of these merger events uh, to try to figure out what happens during the merger, but also trying to build models for the observable uh, properties uh, of these signals. These are simulations that uh, typically take months to run on uh, national computational infrastructure on hundreds to maybe a thousand cores for, for all code. Uh, so really we can only do a few of these simulations at a time uh, and we can just unfortunately wake up one day and decide, oh, LIGO saw something, we would like to exactly redo that, <laughs> that specific event. Um, it, it takes some, some time to react. Um, in this talk, uh, I'd like to uh, first give you an idea of what we have learned from numerical simulations about what happens during these mergers, and particularly a black hole neutron star merger and a little bit neutron star neutron star mergers. I spend most more time doing black hole neutron star merger simulation than neutron star neutron star simulations. Uh, and then see or, or we can connect these two actual models for the observable signals and then what we can learn from from these observations and I'm actually going to start with that and partly focused on uh, what we can learn about the properties of dense matter uh, at the very core of neutron star and about uh, about nuclear synthesis the formation of heavy elements in these in these systems. Right, and don't don't hesitate to interrupt me if you have questions so I think we'll also have a discussion after this All right. So uh, before getting into uh, into the uh, you know the, the, the details, let me give you an idea of what one of these systems would look like. This is uh, a simulation of a black hole neutron star uh, merger from a, from a few years ago. Uh, the the object on the right is the black hole. The object on the left is the neutron star matter. I don't worry too much about the mesh here, which shows where the grid from the simulation is. Uh, but this is just before the two objects collide. The neutron star is going to orbit the black hole a few times and then eventually gets ripped apart by the gravitational field of the black hole, uh, ejecting some matter into the surrounding interstellar medium. Um, a little bit more falls back onto that accretion torus that you see forming here around the black hole. And most of the matter that was originally in the neutron star actually rapidly accretes onto, onto the black hole. Uh, now, this is a, a movie that is uh, extremely slowed down. The actual time scale for this entire movie is more uh, two hundredths of a second, so uh, 20 milliseconds. So this is a very, very rapid event uh, in which a lot of matter, the neutron star is maybe in this case one and a half times the mass of the sun, the black hole is about five times the mass of the sun. Uh, so a lot of matter is reorganized in a very short amount of time, leading to the ejection of matter at relativistic speed and release of a lot of energy in both gravitational waves and later uh, electromagnetic signals. Right. Um, so two, two of the questions that I, that I want to emphasize in this talk, and there's a lot more that we can do with these systems, but those are the two that I tried to talk a bit more about here, uh, have to do with the connection between these events and nuclear physics and what we can learn about nuclear physics you know, by studying neutron star mergers. And the first has to do with studying the properties of very dense matter at the core of neutron stars. Uh, we know that as we get deeper in a neutron star, the density increases and eventually is going to reach densities close to what you find uh, in atomic nuclei. Uh, and as we get close to these densities, we know that we are going to get more and more neutron rich matter. Uh, but when we really get to the core of a neutron star, we are not entirely sure exactly what happens. It's possible that it's still mostly neutron rich matter. Uh, that's one possibility. 
But even if that's the case, we don't really know what the strength of interactions between all of those densely packed neutrons is. Uh, it could also be that it transitioned to a different phase of matter, uh, for example, a, a quagluon plasma. Uh, and if that's the case, uh, it should leave an imprint on uh, one thing that we can hope to observe, which is uh, the size of neutron stars and how it deforms an, in gravitational fields. Uh, and so on the left, you can see uh, different phenomenological models for uh, the actual interior properties of neutron stars and how they translate into different mass radius relationship uh, for, for neutron stars. And so if you were to measure the mass of a neutron star and its radius, you can rule out a number of these models. Uh, the other thing to note on this plot is that all of these equations of state, all of these models have a maximum mass for neutron star, which for realistic, uh, well, currently a large equation of state range, maybe between two to two and a half. You might uh, get more str uh, stringent constraint if you take into account recent neutron star observations, but roughly that's the range. Um, uh, and it, each of these uh, models has a different maximum mass. And so if we can measure what the maximum mass of an isolated neutron star is, uh, then we can actually get some information about nuclear physics. And above that mass, if it's not rotating, the neutron star just collapses and does its own weight. Um, the, second, the second thing that, that I'm going to try to give you an idea of how we can, we can constrain is the formation of heavy elements in uh, possibly neutron star mergers. Uh, if you look at this periodic table here, uh, we are going to particularly focus on all of the light yellow uh, part of the periodic table here, uh, which are elements formed in the uh, R process, rapid neutron capture nucleosynthesis. Uh, so that's a process in which uh, some seed nuclei are going to rapidly capture neutrons in a neutron rich environment, uh, form very unstable, very neutron rich nuclei. And then these nuclei rapidly decay towards uh, mostly these elements here in light yellow. Uh, so we, we, are, we understand mostly uh, the process itself. We know that it has to happen in a very neutron rich environment so that there are many neutrons to capture, uh, but we are not 100% sure why it's happening in the universe. We know these elements exist. We can measure their abundance and their, their relative abundance. Uh, but exactly why it's happening is still a bit of an open question. Uh, neutron star mergers are very good candidates uh, because they naturally eject very neutron-rich matter. And we have actually observed in the first neutron star merger uh, a kilonova, which is a signal powered by the radioactive decays of at least some of these elements. So we know it happens. Uh, the open question is whether they, they can explain the actual observed abundance of all of these elements uh, and whether there are enough neutron star mergers in, in the universe to actually produce you know, most of these heavy elements. So if we need some other source, uh, the most common alternative being some rare type of uh, supernova explosion, uh, core collapse supernova. Uh, so that, so that, that's the kind of uh, question that we would like to answer. And the, the role here of simulations and observations is that you know, the simulations are going to tell us, hopefully, uh, how much matter is ejected by a given neutron star merger, what its properties are. Then uh, nuclear physics studies can tell us what the outcome of nuclear synthesis is. Uh, in that ejector. Uh, and then we can actually observe the radioactive decays of these elements and also through a combination of gravitational wave and electromagnetic observation, get an idea of the event rate of neutron star merger to know if there are enough of them to actually produce all of the elements. So that's sort of you know, the, the objective in the, long, in the long run. All right. So, uh, those are two, two of the objectives, two of the things that we would like to study with these systems. So let's quickly summarize uh, the kind of thing that we can observe during a neutron star merger and after a neutron star merger. And then I'll get to the actual physics of, of the mergers. Uh, so this is a plot that I'm borrowing from Rodrigo Fernandez and Brian Metzger. Um, we know that before the two objects collide, they are orbiting each other, as we saw in the movie. Uh, initially, they are getting closer together relatively slowly. Uh, can take hundreds of millions of years for the two objects to get closer together. But during most of the time, we don't see them. Uh, it's only during the last few orbits, uh, the last seconds to minutes maybe, uh, that we can actually observe the gravitational wave signal uh, with uh, detectors such as LIGO, Virgo, CAGRA, and so on. Uh, then the two objects are going to collide and merge. That lasts, as I say, one millisecond, two millisecond. 
Uh, that's the phase where really we absolutely need numerical simulations because it's very nonlinear. There are no known solutions for what happens during, uh, during that phase at all. We can't even make good reasonable approximations without actually doing full simulation in general relativity. Uh, and during that phase, you start to eject a fair amount of matter, which is going to eventually power electromagnetic emission later on. Uh, the result of that merger can be either black holes surrounded by an accretion torus, as we have seen in the black hole neutron star case, uh, or it can sometimes be a massive neutron star surrounded by an accretion torus if you have two relatively low mass neutron star merging together. Uh, and that system is going to keep evolving for a longer time scale. Uh, and during that time, matter keeps accreting onto the central object, and some matter keeps being ejected from the disk in disk winds. Uh, initially, there, there is a fair amount of matter ejected in the faster accretion phase, which lasts maybe one tenth of a second or a second. And then uh, there is longer evolution of a one to 10 seconds during which the disk viscosity spreads and keep ejecting material. Uh, and that also uh, requires some simulations, uh, but because the time scale for evolution is much longer, we typically need to do more approximations uh, in order to evolve them for that long. So it's typically done with different codes than uh, the merger code, which tend to start maybe 50 to 100 milliseconds after merger at least. Um, so, so that's the part uh, you know, that, where numerical simulations uh, in general relativity are involved. Uh, but from that, we cannot really uh, directly infer what the actual observables, especially for electromagnetic emission are. We can, we can make good models for the gravitational wave signal, but not for the uh, electromagnetic emission, because all we have is matter that has been ejected. Uh, and then in that matter, uh, we are going to have our process nucleosynthesis happening, uh, which is going to release energy into the ejected material. Initially, that ejecta is optically thick, uh, it's uh, opaque to uh, at least optical infrared UV photons. Uh, and so the heat, the, the energy release mostly goes into heating the ejecta and neutrinos that just leave the system. Uh, but over a longer time scale, as the material expands uh, and cools down a little bit, uh, it can actually become transparent to uh, UV optical infrared photons. And that's when we can actually observe it as a, as a kilonova. Uh, now, the, the important thing here is that the properties of the kilonova, the, its brightness, uh, its color, its evolution in time and color, uh, are all dependent on the mass of matter that was ejected, the velocity, uh, the composition of the ejecta, so the relative number of protons and neutrons, the geometry of the ejecta, and also of uh, what was happening during nucleosynthesis, what type of elements were formed, and uh, in particular, what, they, what the opacity of the resulting uh, elements are. And so by observing kilonovi, we can get very useful information about uh, what was happening during nucleosynthesis and what the properties of the merging objects initially were. Uh, and that's at least the idealized uh, case in practice because there are many uncertainties in the simulations as well as in the nuclear physics. Uh, and also, of course, because it's very hard to observe these systems with high accuracy. Uh, this is not something that we can reliably do uh, at this point, as we will see, uh, but we can start to get some information, at least about the merging compact objects. And hopefully in the future, we'll be able to do this inversion more uh, accurately. All right. Uh, so let, let me uh, move on to uh, what actually happens during a merger according to numerical simulations. I'm going to start with black hole neutron star system and then briefly talk about neutron star neutron star merger. Um, so for black hole neutron star systems, uh, there are effectively two main outcomes um, in, uh, for the merger. The first one is the one that I showed in the first movie, uh, shown in a different system here for a relatively low mass system where the neutron star is disrupted by the black hole. Some matter is ejected, some matter forms an accretion torus, which is then going to be able to evolve and eject more matter. This is the case where you can get a kilonova or a gamma ray burst potentially as well. Uh, and then there is a less favorable case for electromagnetic signal where the neutron star reaches the innermost stable circular orbit of the black hole, which is the point at which it just has to plunge into the black hole. And if that happens before the neutron star is ripped apart, well, then we don't have anything left as in, as in this movie. 
Uh, there is no ejecta, there is no accretion in this quadrant. It's at most a very, very small amount. Uh, and so that, this is, of course, very uh, unfavorable if you want to observe electromagnetic signals coming from these systems. Uh, there are mainly uh, three dimensionless parameters that, according to simulations, uh, determine the outcome of, of these mergers. Uh, and that's some measure of the mass asymmetry between the system, for example, uh, the symmetric mass ratio, so the relative mass of the black hole and neutron star. Uh, how compact the neutron star is, uh, whether it has large radius or small radius, and how rapidly the black hole is spinning, or more accurately, the component of the spin that is along the orbital angular momentum uh, of, the, of the system. Uh, and typically, if you have a massive black hole, it's going to be hard to disrupt the neutron star. If you have a larger neutron star, it's easier to disrupt it because it's less gravitationally bound. Uh, and if you have a rapidly spinning black hole, it's also easier to disrupt the neutron star. So if we want a bright kilonova, we want a low mass black hole, a large neutron star, and a rapidly spinning black hole if we can. Uh, and uh, by fitting, uh, the results of many numerical simulations, both from uh, the success collaboration that I'm a part of, but also a large number of simulations from the SACRA uh, group uh, led by Masaru Shibata, as well as some simulations from uh, the Illinois group of uh, uh, Stu Shapiro. Uh, we have managed to you know, build formulae for, to, that can reasonably well predict what the outcome of a given merger is, in terms of whether it disrupts the neutron star or not, and if it disrupts how much uh, mass remains outside of the black hole after a merger. Uh, and the latest uh, instance of, of, that, uh, of that formula is in a, a paper from two years ago with uh, the with Tanya Hinder and Samaya Nisanke. Uh, there are also uh, predictions for the amount of matter ejected dynamically at the time of merger, uh, including by uh, uh, Kawaguchi uh, and uh, some uh, update to that formula in a paper that I wrote with Christian Kruger. Uh, all of those give us a pretty good idea of what's happening during uh, the, the most dynamical phase of a black hole neutron star merger. Uh, so so what, what can we do uh, with this? Well, ideally, we would want to have a system where we have a gravitational wave signal and an electromagnetic counterpart. Uh, a kilonova would even be better than a gamma ray burst for this, uh, because then we know that there is disruption of the neutron star. Uh, that allows us to put some pretty strong constraint on the parameters of the system that uh, greatly improve what we can do is just gravitational waves. Uh, we, if there's a kilonova, we can also get some information at least about the amount of mass that was ejected, hopefully, maybe not very accurately, depends on the observations and or trust in the nuclear physics used to interpret these observations. Uh, but we can get some information about it, which can allow us to reduce the error bars on the, on the parameters of the system. Uh, if it's just a gamma ray burst, it's a lot harder to do because connecting the properties of gamma ray burst, the properties of the merging objects is, very, is beyond what we can currently do uh, in, in black hole neutron star mergers. Uh, and so uh, it's, it's a lot harder to actually invert that to the properties of the merging object. Uh, but it at least tells us that there, there was some disruption of the neutron star, which in, its, in itself is very useful. Well, that's not what we have right now. Uh, the best we have so far is uh, non-detections in uh, electromagnetic signals. Uh, and for example, uh, here is uh, something that we do uh, did, did uh, you know, uh, for GW190426, uh, which is possibly a black hole neutron star merger, uh, or possibly uh, a terrestrial event. Uh, who knows? Uh, <laughs> uh, but at least if it's if it's real, it's probably a black hole neutron star merger. Um, and uh, because we didn't see any, uh, you know, th there was no, no observation of, uh, of an electromagnetic counterpart. The best you can say is that if, uh, if the event was happening in the part of the sky that was observed, uh, we can put limits on how much mass was ejected and from that invert to um, basically a maximum spin for the black hole as a function of the mass ratio and size of the neutron star, which is what I was on the uh, here. Uh, and you can see that uh, you know, because here the limit is just 90% uh, of the solar mass being ejected or less, uh, the constraint on the spin here is not, is not a very strong. Uh, it's a lot stronger to actually have an observation that to have non-detection for black hole neutron star mergers. Uh, in particular, and this was done before uh, LIGO actually published the uh, parameter estimation. Uh, no, we know that uh, 
given the parameter estimation uh, released by LIGO, uh, well, the results here are consistent with those parameter estimation, but do not actually provide any additional information because the spin was actually lower than anything, uh, uh, any constraint we put here. So, uh, but hopefully in the future, we will be able to actually get joint observation of these systems with uh, electromagnetic signals. And then, then we can actually get much stronger constraint. Or if we have an event that is well localized and we can put stronger limits on the amount of mass ejected, that would also be useful. All right. Uh, now let's move uh, a little bit to a uh, neutron star, neutron star merger. Uh, I'm going to spend a little bit uh, less time on, on that. I'm sure Tim could tell you a, a lot more about it uh, <laughs> uh, if you want. Um, so in neutron star mergers, I would say the, maybe the main determinant of, uh, of the outcome of the merger, a combination of, again, the mass ratio of the system, but also the ratio of the total mass of the system to uh, the maximum mass of an isolated neutron star. Uh, effectively, if the mass of the system is very large compared to the maximum mass of a neutron star, then the, as soon as they get into contact, the neutron star are going to collapse to a black hole, leaving very little matter behind. Uh, and the threshold at which you know, this rapid collapse happens has been well determined in particular by a uh, formula uh, derived by uh, Andy Bauswein and collaborators. Uh, sorry, no. Uh, yeah, um, yeah, yes, yes, yes. Um, uh, and uh, if, if the system is nearly equal mass, then there is very little mass left outside of the black hole. If the mass asymmetry is larger, then it behaves a little bit more like a black hole neutron star merger where the lower mass neutron star is partially disrupted as a tidal tail, uh, and then you can still get more matter outside of the black hole. But it needs a mass ratio that is actually pretty high by neutron star merger standards. Uh, if the mass of the system is lower, on the other hand, uh, you are going to at least temporarily form a neutron star at the center, and then you have more time to form an accretion torus around it. And that's when things get messier because the long evolution of that remnant uh, is not very, very well constrained at this, at this point. That's, that's where there are much larger errors. Uh, but we know at least there should be some, uh, some ejection of matter in that system and the formation of a massive uh, accretion torus. All right. So, uh, we can, do, we can make some, um, some inferences about what happens in a neutron star merger if, uh, you know, if we actually observe electromagnetic signals. A lot of it, this was done for uh, the first uh, neutron star merger observe. I'm not going to uh, get much into that. Uh, um, my, Michael and, and Tim have done a lot of work on that as well. Um, uh, here, I'm going to show you basically what, what, what I feel we can most robustly say about a neutron star merger if we have a joint observation. Uh, th this is a study uh, done by Amelia Engel, who was a graduate student here at UNH, um, where uh, we try to see what, what would have, you know, what would have been able, what we would have been able to say if for the second neutron star merger, which was a much more massive system than the first, uh, we had actually seen an electromagnetic observation uh, with a few percent of a solar mass being ejected. We didn't see anything in that system, which is perfectly consistent with uh, LIGO parameters. Uh, but if we assume that we had actually seen something, uh, well, we can take the many different models that exist for how much matter could be ejected in neutron star mergers, uh, some of which have been derived by, by Tim and Michael, uh, so, some by, by my group, some by David Radice, uh, and uh, see which, uh, which mass reduce relationship, which equation of state models are actually compatible with such an observation. And there's a fair amount of disagreement between the different uh, models, but there is a, at least good agreement on which equation of state are not possible at all, which are these uh, lower uh, radius, lower maximum mass equations of state, which everyone agrees should rapidly collapse to a black hole in such a system and not power a very bright kilonova. nova. Uh, so I think this is, uh, this is the most robust inference that we can do so far uh, is uh, uh, saying that uh, these uh, more compact uh, neutron stars uh, could be ruled out if we actually uh, see a relatively massive system with, uh, with mass ejection. Uh, of course, uh, the, the actual neutron star merger that was observed uh, with an electromagnetic signal was lower mass than this, so the constraints were not as strong as this. And actually, the, these equations of state are the ones that are still allowed by the first neutron star merger observation. So yeah, if we could see an electromagnetic observation in a more massive neutron star system, we would be able to rule, to rule out more of them, more of these equations of state. All right. Um, okay, so the, the, that was for the, for the merger phase itself, where 
we have a pretty good idea of what's happening uh, in terms of you know, the dynamics of the system, how much matter is ejected, uh, how much matter remains around the black hole of neutron star after merger. Uh, it's typically pretty accurate for those predictions for black hole neutron star mergers within 10% or so. Uh, for neutron star neutron star merger, the system is more compli complex. There's less matter ejected at the time of merger, so the, the relative uncertainties are a bit higher uh, just because of the complexity of the system and the fact that numerical errors, uh, relatively speaking, are, are, are more significant. Um, but really where, where most of, the, of our errors in modeling this system comes is in what happens after that, uh, the long post-merger evolution. And uh, the reason is that you know, now we have a black hole or maybe a neutral star surrounded by that accretion torus, uh, and then some matter that has been ejected and might be falling back onto the, onto the black hole or might just be unbound. Uh, and at that point, there's a lot more complex physics that comes into play uh, that is going to be very difficult to include in numerical simulations uh, reliably, uh, much more costly as well, and limit what we can currently do. Uh, in particular, we need to worry about magnetic fields, uh, which are uh, crucial to understand outflows in, in these post-merger evolutions. And we need to understand uh, neutrino matter interactions and neutrino transport, uh, because neutrinos are the main driver for the change of neutrons into protons into these outflows. Uh, and have a very uh, important impact on the color and uh, time scale of the eventual uh, kilonova emission. Uh, but no code is really able to do all of that properly at the moment. Uh, we, we'll see why, why in a minute. Um, but it is crucial to properly model them because uh, there are quite a number of source of outflows in that post-merger evolution that are going to contribute to our process nuclear synthesis and to kilonova. Uh, there is a small amount of matter that can be ejected uh, after being heated, uh, absorbing neutrinos. Uh, this is more significant if you still have a neutron star at the center of your system, a hot neutron star, which can emit a lot of neutrinos. Uh, there's definitely a lot of matter that is ejected in magnetically driven winds. That's probably the strongest source of matter ejection after the merger. And then on a much longer time scale, there is also a viscous spreading of the disk and some uh, matter ejected uh, through that process as well, which is actually also magnetically driven because it's due to magnetically driven turbulence in the accretion uh, disk. Uh, and there have been quite a few studies of uh, what happens over a longer time scale in these, uh, in these accretion disks, uh, including by Daniel Siegel, Rodrigo Fernandez, Ian Christie, and uh, Sasha Chekovskoy in the Northwestern Group. Uh, and these studies actually agree pretty well on how much matter is ejected given a set of initial conditions. But the actual range of matter ejection vary by above a factor of three, between 15-ish you know, percent of the mass of the disk to up to half of the mass of the disk, or even more than that, possibly if you have a neutron star at the center of your system. Uh, and that is entirely dependent on the initial conditions you choose for that post-merger evolution. Uh, in particular, it is very dependent on how compact the disk is, which we can reasonably understand from merger simulations, but also on how strong the magnetic fields are and what the lar their large scale structure is. And that's really where the main problem is right now, is that numerical simulations are not currently capable of predicting what the large scale structure of magnetic fields is in this remnant after merger. Uh, and because this, this is the main driver of this factor of three difference here, uh, that actually has a very strong impact on the errors that we make when we try to model uh, outflows from these post-merger remnants. Uh, there is also an issue that many of these simulations don't have a very good neutrino physics yet, but that's actually more, a less fundamental issue and we are, we are closer to solving this than the, than the first part. So let me show you uh, briefly why this is an issue. Uh, this is a simulation by Sasha Chernoglazov, who is uh, also a very student at UNH. Uh, and this is a neutron star merger uh, where we see a horizontal slice through the, through the colliding star. So this is the density, the two neutron star colliding. And on the left, you will see the magnetic energy density. Uh, and I'm going to uh, ask you to focus on the region in between the neutron stars, uh, where you see that there is some turbulence driven by a shear instability between the two neutron stars, uh, the kelvin helmholtz instability. Uh, and you can see the growth of very small scale structure with large, uh, very strong magnetic fields. Uh, but this is fine, this, seem, this seems to work in the simulation. <clears throat> but the issue is the growth rate of this instability 
uh, is largest for the smallest wavelength mode. Uh, and that means that as you increase your numerical resolution, as you get smaller and smaller grid spacings, uh, your distance stability grows faster and faster. And we are not at the point where we can actually get a converged answer for the, what the finite magnetic field structure is. We have basically two choices. Either we start with very strong magnetic fields and we can saturate the field at some reasonable level, but there is still an impact on the final results of the large field that you initially put in your simulation. Or you can start with a low field initially, which is more reasonable, but then you don't grow the field to saturation and you don't know what your final state is because you don't have enough resolution. Uh, and so that's basically where, where we are right now. And then the post-merger simulations just basically put a large field by hand in there with some structure chosen by hand. And depending on what they choose, they get different results for how much matter is ejected. Um, so that's, that's an important so source of error of error there. All right. Uh, so uh, to conclude, uh, so what, what do we need if we actually want you know, to build one of those models for Kilonovy and try to use it to interpret uh, you know, the properties of the, of the merging compact objects, the size of neutron stars, uh, how much matter uh, is ejected and what happens in nuclear synthesis. Uh, what well, we need as, as input some binary parameters uh, as well as a choice for the equation of state of neutron stars. And from that, using numerical simulations of the mergers, uh, we can generate some reasonable guesses for what uh, the matter ejected at the time of merger is, what we call the dynamical ejector, as well as the properties of the post-merger remnant. At the moment, we can do that reasonably well for the dynamical ejector. We can determine how much mass is in the post-merger remnant. We have good guesses for the general you know, structure of that remnant as well, also not good uh, formulas that can be used as initial conditions for post-merger evolution yet. Uh, but we don't know the structure of the magnetic field for example. Uh, and then we have to run long post-merger simulations, which for neutron star, neutron star mergers are actually the main source of, eject, of matter ejection. For black hole neutron star merger, certainly not negligible at least. Uh, and these need as initial conditions, the outcome of the merger, including the structure of the magnetic field. Uh, given this, we can actually get pretty good predictions for the disk outflows, but because we are still missing this part, uh, it's actually uh, still limiting what we, what we can say about the disk alphas in, the, in this step. Once we have all of that, we can go into the part that I didn't talk at all, at all about, which is putting that into a photon transport code with detailed uh, description of the elements that were formed during our process nuclear synthesis and the opacities, and from there generate a kilonova like curve. That is an entirely different problem that also has important certainties uh, and uh, I don't have the time to talk about, about this, but it's certainly something that should not be neglected as well. There are significant nuclear physics uncertainties there that we should also take into account. But that's basically where we are right now. Uh, the dynamics of the merger is reasonably well understood, but because of the li limits on the microphysics, especially the magnetic fields, but also a little bit the nuclear transport, uh, it remains difficult right now to make very re robust, reliable models for the kilonova signal that we can use to robustly infer the parameters of the binaries from, from the observations at the moment. And that's where we need to make the most progress, I think, uh, in, in the future, if we want to improve our ability to understand these systems from observations. Thank you. Uh, I'm happy to take any questions. Uh, and, uh...